It's a new month, and each month we focus on a new idea. Centers for spiritual living all over the world are following this theme together, the global vision, focusing on extracts from the idea of this the vision that we have of a world that works for everyone. And this month, let's see, our, what is our theme? Ah, realizing the power of mind. And the recommended reading for the month is this beautiful book, Whispers in the Stillness, about mindfulness practices, which we'll use in just a moment. And today, our particular topic is a personal experience of the divine, which is based on a statement from our teaching that goes exactly like this. We believe that God is personal to all who feel this indwelling presence. Actually, whether or not you feel the indwelling presence, it's personal to you anyway. And we're about exploring that today. So to set the tone, I'm going to use something that I've adapted from these mindfulness practices. And I'm going to invite you to take a moment to unfurl in your seat. Let stillness come. Perhaps let your eyes close. And as you do that, let yourself become aware of your breath. of your body. And in so doing, let yourself become aware of this present moment. You might notice any passing commentaries if there are some in your mind. But only being aware of them, not adding any stress by adding judgment. Rather, you're allowing a more intuitive and bodily awareness through this calming of your mind. And in so doing, you may notice, I am not the content of my mind. Beyond and beneath the activity of my mind, there is a doorway to silence. And it is from that silence that my answers emerge. So I'm going to notice the answer to this question. I may even want to write down the answer later. What did you know as a child that you need to know again? and allow whatever insights are emerging to be filled with childlike wonder, as if you're discovering, rediscovering, the mystical innocence of your heart. And now, staying in that open receptiveness with the question lingering, you might begin to return to the activity of the room as I tell you a story. Whenever your eyes feel like opening, or perhaps they don't want to open. The story is of a kindergarten teacher who was observing her classroom of children while they were engaged in a drawing exercise. She would occasionally walk around to see what the children's artwork was looking like as it took form. And she got to one little girl who was working quite diligently with a lot of focus. And so she asked the girl, what are you drawing? To which the girl answered, I'm, I'm drawing God. And the teacher paused for a moment and said, but no one knows what God looks like. And without missing a beat or without looking up from her drawing, the little girl replied, they will in just a minute. (laughs) 
I've appreciated my studies here at the Center for Spiritual Living and what I've learned through our teaching, which is called the Science of Mind, because I've learned to re-look at God and look again at what I've learned about God, about what God looks like and what God is like. And through the course of this exploration, I've become more inclined to use words such as intelligence or mind, a whole list of synonyms when I'm talking about and exploring this subject, when I'm thinking about an overall and unifying power, whatever it is. So I've got my long list of synonyms. And I realize that defining God is not a simple task. It's impossible. It's a good place to begin with all those big words that religions often use when we're starting this quest. You know, the words like infinite and omnipresent and um, absolute and eternal and omniscient. Very good place to start. But even so, as I sit with these words and explore from them, it becomes apparent just like it says in the Tao Te Ching, that whatever the name is that I land on to identify the divine, it's probably not enough. It's probably not adequate. Maybe not even accurate. I, I found it quite helpful to put names aside for a moment and work with the pronoun it. When I'm trying to understand what the divine is to me, it is very helpful because it reminds me that I have already put aside my childhood idea of a man in the sky, a benevolent dictator <laughs> who's managing the affairs of the world. The it gives me freedom from gender-specific terms and ideas, and it helps me separate from the tendency to project human-like attributes onto this whatever it is, so that I can instead turn to much, much larger ideas than how you and I behave. Ideas such as, um, for example, that whatever it is, there is only one of its kind. It would have to be because only one thing can hold the title everywhere present. Everywhere present doesn't leave any room for something else. See, and then my mind kicks in. And you know, I don't, I don't mind at all that I get all tangled up when I'm trying to define the divine. I'm on a quest. I'm on a quest to find a simple and easy way to describe it, and I keep on discovering new and interesting angles and dimensions, none of which are truly simple at all. Maybe my all-time favorite definition comes from The Lazy Man's Guide to Enlightenment by Thaddeus Golas. It, it's probably the statement that I can land on most easily without getting irritated. It goes like this. The universe is made up of one kind of whatever it is, which cannot be defined. For our purpose, it isn't necessary to try to define it. All we need to do is assume that there is only one kind of whatever it is and see if it leads to a reasonable explanation for the world as we know it. No, oh, no. The universe is made up of one kind of whatever it is. That's an idea I like. But it's not simple when I sit with it. And maybe it's the same for you. I sit with it, and it births all kinds of other questions. Well then, why is the world in the state it is in? 
Why are people warring with each other? Why is there racism? Why is there corruption? Why are civilizations decaying? Why? Why? How do I explain all of that in terms of all of this? And I don't know the answers. I think of the phrase, the universe is made up of one kind of whatever it is, more as a mission to accomplish than a puzzle to solve. To, to me, the phrase, the universe is made up of one kind of whatever it is, is a personal challenge that I accept to see if I can see the world like that. Can I see the world like that? Can I see the world as if everything is a product of whatever it is, and then see if that leads to a deeper understanding, a more compassionate engagement with the world. In my experience, for me, it does. And it works very well for me to imagine that whatever it is, is oneness or wholeness. And then I can let that idea prompt me to try to look at each person I meet in a single day as if they are a product of wholeness. I can let it prompt me to try and, and treat everything, every object I, I come in contact with, as if it is treasured because it was made from it. See, it's a quest. And in the course of a single day, I stray from my self-imposed mission my 326 million times. A second. <laughs> and I have to course correct frequently to return to the view point of wholeness. And to me, that is exactly what spiritual living is all about for me. Can I stay on course? One of my teachers, a, a beautiful lady named Helen Street, she had this lovely childlike relationship with the divine. She would say, you see all of this? This is God in drag. And she would have a playful relationship with her idea of the divine. She would call God Big Daddy. And she would, in her morning meditation, say, All right, Big Daddy, bring it on. Let's see how you're going to try and trick me today. You're going to try and trick me that it's not you. But I'm going to stay on course. You won't fool me. I love that. I'm not going to be fooled to think that there is anything else going on here. Our friend and colleague from Palm Desert, Dr. Joe Hooper, says, if we could simply think like a child and realize the only obstruction we put between us and spirit are ideas of separation, ideas that were placed there by our own personal belief system. However, we got to that belief system, because sometimes we inherited it from the dominant adults as we were in our formative years, and we don't even know that they're there yet. What if we could take the innocence of that childlike idea of God and the unconditional love and availability where could that lead us? What would that feel like? There is no mystery or secret handshake that can get us into the kingdom of heaven each day. It's up to us to open ourselves to the indwelling presence that is available to each one of us. And I'm, I'm reading that and I'm thinking about that child and the drawing exercise, drawing God. And I thought, I want to do that. I want to do that exercise myself. I want you to do that exercise. I want everybody to do that exercise. I'd love to see the world drawing a picture of God. Maybe we would come up with 
something truly amazing. Maybe some of us would come up with self-portraits. Maybe some of us would come up with portraits of each other. Maybe some of us would draw landscapes of this world just as it is and just as it is not with all the work that there is still for us to do in it. And maybe some of us would wrestle with how to draw something abstract that is beyond time and space and multidimensional on a piece of paper. Or if you're not the drawing type of person, here's another exercise. Imagine that you have been invited to speak on national television and you have exactly five minutes to tell the whole world, to articulate what you believe. So you don't have time to explain how you got to that belief. You just have enough time to say exactly what you believe. <laughs> what would you say? Maybe as you were preparing, you'd ask yourself the question, what is God to me? What are my synonyms? What does it mean to me? And where is it located? What is reality? And what does it do? In the well-known Hindu scriptures, the Kena Upanishads, one of them, the student asks this beautiful question of the teacher. Who makes my mind to think? Who fills my body with vitality? Who causes my tongue to speak? Who is that invisible one who sees through my eyes and hears through my ears? And the answer from the teacher is so beautiful. The teacher says, That which makes the tongue speak but cannot be spoken by the tongue. That which makes the mind think but cannot be thought by the mind. That which makes the eye see but cannot be seen by the eye. That which makes the ear hear but cannot be heard by the ear that which makes you draw breath, but cannot be drawn in by your breath, that, that is the self indeed. And, my dear, the self is not someone other than you. At the center, we use all kinds of different names for this self. We call it the creative spirit. We call it the divine mind. We call it the thing itself. We call it the universe. We call it the infinite presence. And the message is that each one of us must come to our own understanding and right relationship and right synonym for this something. And that we can no more settle for another person's way than we can breathe with another person's lungs. And why is this so important that we discover what we think and how we're related to divinity? Well, we must go back to the beginning and remember what our theme for March is. Realizing the power of mind. Whose mind? See, because before we begin to explore the way mind works and its power, it's helpful to clear up what exactly do we think it is? And where exactly do we think it's located? And how does it work? And what's my relationship to it? And when I am thinking... What mind am I thinking with, especially if I'm considering this idea that there is only one kind of whatever it is and it's everywhere present, then I, I've got to think, do I even have my own separate mind? This is like reading the user manual before putting the product together. 
Listen to these beautiful words from A New Design for Living by Ernest Holmes. Some really juicy ideas in this. The indwelling God is the greatest single factor in our whole lives. It means that there is nothing between us and God. There is no intermediary. There is no place to go to find God. God already exists in the midst of us. And if we would try to seek God elsewhere, it would be like God trying to hunt for itself. God is not lost, and neither are we lost or separated from God. The more completely we are able to see this, the more completely it will respond to us. Oh, there are some words. Indwelling. No intermediary. No separation. And the more completely we are able to see it, the more completely we will be able to realize it, and maybe even we can say, use it. So our quest then is to get clear. What is divinity to me? Not to discover somebody else's path, not to, you know, how it is. Sometimes I want to rest in the comfort of somebody else telling me how it is. Not to rest in somebody else's definition, because that's how we continue childhood dependencies. No, spiritual maturity is about outgrowing that kind of dependency and really finding our own path with its ambiguities, with its contradictions, with its unanswerable questions, and nobody can do that for you and for me. We must find our own way. I heard a motivational speaker say, and I've remembered it for some 12 years, he said, if it were against the law to believe what you believe, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. What evidence is there in my life that I believe what I believe? Think of that wonderful question. What do you believe divine mind is? What do you believe divine mind is, or whatever synonym you're using? And then, is there any evidence in your life that it is so? And where do you believe this mind is located? And is there any evidence in your life that it is so? Because our answers to these questions are laying down the Groundwork. It's going to make a difference in how we apply the ideas from this month. And there are some exciting topics coming up, like next week, your mind and how to use it. <laughs> and later, identify with what you want. Because when you know that the mind that you are thinking with is located right in the center of one whatever it is, Oh, my God. <laughs> Doesn't it make you just want to stop thinking? <laughs> and really be mindful with the direction you're going to go next. Uh, the real evidence of what we believe is found in our behavior. You know how you handle yourself in the day-to-day -day activities when you're at the top of your game and when you're at the very bottom of the valley of despair. And it all changes all the time. You know, so even if you had a whole year to prepare your answer for that imagined television show, whatever answer you ended up with, this is what I believe, you'd have to hold it lightly because it's just for right now. It's going to evolve and change. You, you know it will. Still, we can think about it as remembering with childlike innocence what we've always known 
And, and just getting clear for this moment in time what I think about it so I can describe it to myself and to all those people on television. And most importantly, so I can make any adjustments in my life if they're necessary so that there is evidence enough to convict me of my beliefs. So let's go back to that mindfulness practice that we started with. And I'm going to change it slightly. Again, I invite you to relax and let your eyes close so that you can begin to become aware of your breath and your body. And in so doing, you become aware of this present moment. If you notice any commentaries passing through your mind, just be aware of them. Try not to add any stress by adding judgment. You're allowing a more intuitive and bodily awareness through this calming practice. So that you may realize, I am not the activity of my mind. Beyond and beneath the activity of my mind, there is a doorway to silence from which my answers come. Now notice the answer to the following question. You may even want to write it down later on in the day. What did you know about divinity as a child that you want to know again? And allow whatever insights are emerging to be filled with the wonder of childlike wisdom and joy. You're letting yourself rediscover the mystical innocence of your own being. Again, to bring this moment of mindful attention to a conclusion, let yourself breathe a little more deeply. Let your fingers and toes move. And when you feel ready, let your eyes begin to open. <coughs> <coughs> 